about tonight. This is, like I said, part one in a series of programs um, out of three. I stole some of your pictures from your various uh, websites. Thank you very much. Um, and this one is all about water use regulations and different water monitoring tools. And we're going to talk about water efficiency, um, particularly important as we realize um, water availability is becoming less predictable um, in the face of climate change. So here's some really great specialists in these areas to talk about how to, how to adapt and deal with some of these issues. So first off is Rachel Chapman. Um, She's from the Humane Agroecology Lab, and she's got vegetable and fruit production expertise, um, water use, climate change adaptation, many, many talents and skills. Um, we're really happy to have her here tonight. And then followed by that will be Joshua Faulkner, um, who's going to talk more about the technologies involved. And he also is incredibly versatile and knowledgeable about all of these things. And I think Rachel and Joshua and some others worked on a, the project together that Josh was going to be talking about with some of these soil moisture monitoring tools and stuff like that. And then finally, Tim Wilcox and Max Tronskeen, am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, from the very always innovative kitchen garden farm, really excited to have you uh, talk about some of the new infrastructure and stuff that you've put in related to water recently. So about 20 minutes talking and 10 minutes for questions, sort of give or take for each um, speaker. So hopefully it will be kind of a little talking and then some interaction and then a little more talking and some interaction. So hopefully that will be, um, keep all of your interest as we go along. That is premature. Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and Rachel, this is all you. Okay. Great. Can everybody um, see, the, see the slides up there on the screen? Yep. All right, here we go. Um, so first of all, thanks so much for the invitation to come. I'm really excited to, to talk with all of you. As Lisa said, my name is Rachel Chapman. Um, I'm with the University of Maine at the School of Food and Agriculture. And before I get started on the talk tonight, I just want to acknowledge that I have some really great collaborators on this project that I'm going to present, Dr. Meredith Niles at UVM and Hannah Aiken, who is our research assistant on the project um, in between her farming gigs. So uh, let's start with just a quick summary of why we care about water efficiency, which I hope will provide some background, um, not just for my talk, but also for Joshua's that comes up next. Uh, the first reason, which is pretty common sense to everyone here, I bet, is that we need to be mindful about how to balance water use in agriculture and in conservation. So maintaining our shared natural resource is something that I think most of us would agree is important. Um, and while at the same time enabling farms to access the water they need for successful production. Um, second, we are looking ahead to a new climate normal. So we are very fortunate that we are not dealing with some of the, the hardship that's going on out west right now or that's hitting the Gulf Coast, but um, we will have our own particular challenges to face and we are starting to face those already, uh, mostly in the form of changing patterns of rain and snowfall. So these seasonal changes are going to have an effect on supply and availability of fresh water in our region on a localized scale. Um, and stemming from this change in supply, what we can expect also compounded by growing populations in metropolitan areas and an ever increasing demand from industry, I think we can expect to see some greater competition for fresh water in the future. So this is, a, this is an issue that's been raised by legal scholars um, as something that we need to pay some close attention to and if possible, anticipate, even though historically we've, you know, our region has been very water rich. So lastly, along with this sense of increased competition, this potential for increased competition, um, we are likely to see some changes in regulations around water use. More likely in the near term, we might start to see states allocating greater resources towards enforcing regulations that have already been on the books but haven't been enforced um, and this will likely vary state by state and you will kind of get a taste of that in this presentation. So let's talk about what water needs are in our region right now and what the trends have been. Um, it's no surprise that irrigation is the most significant water use in agriculture on a global scale 
Um, in temperate climates, it's often not talked about, uh, like in regions like ours, because as I uh, mentioned previously, historically, we've had enough rainfall to meet crop needs. However, over the past several decades, more and more growers are investing in irrigation and starting to rely on having available ground and surface water to, to irrigate. So the chart on the slide shows between 1992, which are the red dots, and 2018, which are the blue dots, um, the total number of irrigated acres in Northeast states increased. States like New Jersey and Delaware, this increase has been pretty dramatic, um, while other states like Vermont and New Hampshire, uh, the change has been less dramatic. Um, I thought it was interesting to note here that in Massachusetts, you see almost a doubling in the total number of irrigated acres. Even when we normalize this by the total number of um, acres farmed, we see a similar trend. So the take home message is in the Northeast, we irrigate, we depend on irrigation water, it's important. Climate forecasts suggest that along with changing precipitation patterns in our region, we're also expecting to see temperature increases. And this translates into higher evapotranspiration rates, which will increase water demand. So the figure on the slide is from a paper by McDonald and Gerbetz, which I blatantly stole from another presentation by Joshua. <laughs> um, and this paper models predicted withdrawal ratio, or in other words, the relationship between the water demand in 2005 and the projected demand in 2090. And you can see each of the US states are noted on the slide. The open circles indicate commonly used irrigation practices, while the squares indicate efficient irrigation drip practices like drip systems. Um, I've added a red line to show you where one is above which irrigation is projected, irrigation demand is projected to increase, below which it's projected to decrease. And Massachusetts is actually looking pretty good in this model. Um, the figure shows that efficient irrigation practices are likely widely in use already, and demands for withdrawals are unlikely to change very much. However, this isn't true for all the states in the Northeast, um, both my home state of Vermont and my adopted home state of Maine, for example, are expected to see withdrawal ratios closer, closer to 1.75, indicating that demand is going to go up, even though efficient practices are already in use. So with this background, um, my colleagues and I realized that we needed to better understand how states in the Northeast are allocating water resources and how current regulatory approaches affect agriculture. So lots of attention is paid to rules and regulations around water in Western states for very good reason. But as a former commercial farmer myself and a former extension educator, I realized I didn't know anything about what the rules were here. Um, so specifically, we wanted to better understand what the rules were, how they were developed, if they vary state by state, and if these variations affect how farmers actually use water. So at the root of this set of questions is a concern that as water becomes more scarce in some parts of our region, and as competition increases, um, are our current rules and regulations equipped to handle that change? We learned really quickly through this review that water law governance in the US is really complicated, <laughs> um, to say the least. And this is in part because it has a twofold origin story. So each state operates from statutory guidance or doctrines which create a legal framework um, and designate agencies to enforce that framework. And then it refines the rules through case law or litigation, which interprets the statutory guidelines through dispute and sets precedents for future rules. So to make things more complicated, um, groundwater and surface water are treated differently in many states, despite the fact that any hydrologist will tell you they are interconnected systems. So up on the slide, you can see that there are four groundwater doctrines applied widely in the Northeast. Um, I'll run through them very quickly. Absolute dominion is also known as the rule of capture and is more common in Western states. It's also known as um, first in line, first in right. And it allows a landowner to use as much groundwater as they want without consideration of other landowners. And it only applies to a few states in the Northeast, most notably in Maine. Reasonable use is also referred to as the American rule. It's the most common in our region. It requires allocated groundwater to be put to quote unquote, a reasonable use on the overlying tract of land from which it's taken. And almost any amount of water can be used as long as it's considered reasonable. Um, the rule is used in many states, but it's also sometimes used in conjunction with other guiding doctrines. And as you can see on the map on the right, the majority of states in the Northeast have water governance approaches that are built on this idea of reasonable use. 
Correlative rights um, permits landowners over an aquifer equal rights to the underlying water. So any, all the owners over that aquifer have to share access, even if their shared use of it depletes the aquifer overall. Um, and lastly, public trust doctrine is a relatively new doctrine. Um, and it requires states to manage both for quality and quantity of groundwater. And it's explicit in that it has to be managed for the benefit of the greater public for citizens of the state. It establishes a framework that identifies groundwater specifically in this case as a vital resource um, that benefits all citizens. And it, it does something pretty revolutionary when it prioritizes public over private interest. Likewise, there are several important surface water doctrines that guide Northeast governance. The first of these, and they tend to overlap. They're kind of confusing the way they work together. So the first is riparian rights, which say that riparian users have equal rights to a water body, a surface water body. But upper owners, people who are upstream, um, can't decrease the ability of downstream users to use the water. So in this system, water withdrawn but not consumed can't be unreasonably detained or diverted. It has to be returned to the stream from which it's taken. Regulated riparianism is similar except that it's explicit in that it designates a specific agency to monitor the water rights. And lastly, reasonable use means that all riparian users may freely use the water so long as it doesn't unreasonably interfere with the use of other quote unquote riparian owners. So there are lots of variations of these doctrines and you can see on the slide that there's lots of variations within our, within our neck of the woods. Um, but most states in, our, uh, in the Northeast adhere to either riparian rights or regulated riparianism. And that, I promise, is the most boring part of this talk. <laughs> so we also looked into what the withdrawal rules were in each state and how much um, the states in the Northeast had in common. And what we found is that there is a ton of variation when it comes to both groundwater and surface water withdrawal rules. So I've only included the groundwater rules on this slide just to drive home the point that there's differences. Um, I have a, a sheet that I can provide anyone who's interested that kind of catalogs the rules for both ground and surface water state by state. Um, but what we did is we kind of took the NAS data about irrigation use and compared it to these rules and found that there's no statistical uh, difference between how much water people were using based on these variations. So they're all different, but it's unclear whether or not it actually has an impact on ag practices. And then the last thing we looked at was whether states treated agriculture differently during periods of drought than other users. So specifically, we wanted to see if there are any regulatory guidelines that prioritized ag as water becomes more scarce. Interestingly, we found a split between Northeast states with some articulating the importance of agricultural water access and others kind of failing to do so. Um, scarcity provisions played out differently in different places, as you will not be surprised to learn. In some states, the approach is to incorporate priority use into the permitting and regulate, regulatory requirements, essentially lowering the burden on ag users. Um, in other states, there's a hierarchy of use that gets established, indicating who gets to use water first when resources are diminished. And in other states, resources have been dedicated towards helping farmers develop their access to water resources using state or federal funds. This was the case in Maine in the early part of the 2000s, where the state put quite a bit of money towards the development of farm ponds to reduce dependence on low flow streams and wetlands. So after reviewing the different approaches taken by different states to this, what I would say is a really important issue, the big question, which I raised at the beginning, which I'll raise again here, is that these regulations were developed with the assumption that water as a natural resource is plentiful and that recharge is reliable and will remain so into the future. But based on climate forecasts that we discussed earlier in our own experience this summer and in 2016, um, I'm not sure we can continue to rely on this assumption. And I would argue that the degree to which current rules, regulations, and statutes, including these scarcity provisions, help or hurt agriculture during times of drought remain largely untested. I think the test is coming, and I think it behooves us all to be keyed into it. Um, some specific challenges that we can keep our eyes on are the fractured way in which water resources are managed in many states, with several different agencies having purview over different aspects of the system. 
Um, additionally, states don't really have the capacity at this point in many places to enforce what's currently on the books, but that doesn't mean that in the future, resources wouldn't be allocated to, to enforcing some rules that aren't currently enforced. My biggest suggestion is that ag as an industry gets better at tracking the water that we use and that we need in order to be in a position to advocate for it when and if we need to. So to sum it all up, I would say that in the future, we can count on seasonal droughts becoming more and more normal here in the Northeast. And by extension, I think we should expect that in some parts of our region, water resources are going to become scarcer on a seasonal basis, and there might be greater competition for water. Um, there's a potential for enforcement of current water regulations to change based on agency, agency capacity and state directives. And there's the potential for our situation to surpass the regulatory mechanisms that have been set up to fairly allocate water. Um, so with that, I will say, I, are we doing questions in between presentations or should I hand it back to, to Lisa? Yeah, I, now I think would be a good time to, you were right, you're so good with timing. Um, <laughs> so we have another uh, 10 minutes or so before, um, or we, you know, we can obviously start earlier, but if anyone has any questions, we definitely have time now to, to take some of those. I don't think that there's anything in the chat. Um, so if anybody wants to, I believe you can unmute yourselves. And so if you do have a question, either put it in the chat or just speak up. Um, I will say at this point that Massachusetts has been putting together a, the, a drought task force um, to kind of better assess on the ground what's happening place to place in terms of water availability and water usage um, and to kind of help farmers access resources and better understand some of these regulations and um, someone from DEP or maybe Department of, well, so there's a slot next week in the program that, that's happening the same time next week, there is um, a slot for the Department of Agricultural Resources to talk about FSMA and water testing and all that stuff, but we're also, they're also going to take some of that time to talk about these regulations that you're talking about, Rachel, as, as they relate to Massachusetts farmers. So um, tune back in if you have specific questions about that and want to learn more about this drought task force that, that they put together. And it looks like some chat questions have come in. Um, so Rachel, the first one from uh, Glenn, what are the prospects for use of groundwater wells for irrigation versus surface water? Um, it's uh, the prospects meaning in New England, are they a better bet? Stipulates. Um, yeah, and Glenn, if you wanted to speak up to you, you're welcome to um, clarify your question verbally. Cost for accessing groundwater, I guess, versus... Oh, oh. Um, well, I mean, I, I think that in general, the cost of accessing groundwater through drilling new wells is obviously higher upfront cost <laughs> than, than pumping out of streams. Um, the, the regulatory burden and the cost of going through that process, I think, again, is different state by state. A state like Maryland has um, a pretty high bar for what a farm has to do in order to uh, justify drilling a new well for agricultural purposes. And they have to kind of submit a very detailed um, application process or application, which has an extensive review process. Um, other states, I, I don't think that is the case at all, uh, but the, the process of kind of reporting or getting permits to pump out of surface water bodies might be kind of a, a rolling cost labor-wise, being able to keep track of how much you pump. Um, I know in Vermont, you're supposed to kind of calculate the de minimis rate of a stream before you stick your hose in every time, um, which, is I think a, a pretty significant record keeping burden, but definitely doesn't you know compare to the cost of drilling a well. I'm not sure if that's getting at the question so much. Well, he added um, asking the question, so groundwater, it, it, asking whether or not groundwater is likely to be a significant part of irrigation over the next 10 to 30 years. So is that the assumption that groundwater will become less or more depleted, I guess, over? 
Um, I think that it's, it's really hard to tell being able to, and Joshua might be able to speak to this also, but being able to assess how much groundwater there is, is a really tricky science. Mm -hmm. Um, and to my knowledge, I haven't seen any assessments that like forecast groundwater availability in the Northeast, like in any, you know, future scenarios. Um, USGS Water Center, which is based out of Concord, but serves all of New England, has um, put together some pretty interesting forecasts for surface water changes, including um, changes in snowpack and changes in stream flow and things like that at a pretty fine scale, which I find fascinating. So far, it's only available for New Hampshire, but they're working on um, doing the rest of the New England states. But groundwater, um, at least in my experience, is a little bit more of a black box. Yeah. Um, well, so maybe this is a related question. Um, John uh, Stuckel asked, uh, what do we know about the rate of groundwater withdrawal versus the rate of recharge um, in the major New England aquifers? So, or Northeast, I suppose. Um, and he asked, what consequences will occur with increased withdrawal? So the reduced base flow impact on fisheries, impact on wetlands by lower water table, um, yeah, that's a great question. I haven't seen any kind of assessment that's relevant to the Northeast, but I think one of the things that um, we can do to be more proactive is to start to look to areas that do struggle with those things and maybe try to anticipate how we will, how we will do with them. And there are, I mean, there are plenty of aquifers out west. The Oglala Aquifer is a great example of um, of a region that can no longer really sustain agriculture in the same way that it used to. Um, and from a policy perspective, like looking at different policy mechanisms for dealing with that, I think everybody's kind of waiting to see how things go in California with the setting up of water districts and um, the pumping moratoriums in some places that, uh, and the kind of consequence of that, which is a lot more fallowed land. Mm -hmm. um, so, watching and learning and thinking about how those types of regulatory frameworks could be used here in better ways, perhaps, um, I think would yeah. be great. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose that's where we'll also be talking about other adaptation strategies, talking about needing less water. So I think, and that's another part of what you're working on with like the climate fellowship for ag educators and stuff is to think about strategies to have to use less water ultimately. Is that Absolutely, yeah, yes. Um, and then, yeah, still more time for questions. Uh, another one came in, would it be a good idea, Rachel, to measure the height of the water in your groundwater or teasing well to get an idea of whether there are annual or seasonal changes that could indicate future supply? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know enough about how to measure groundwater availability to be able to answer that well. <laughs> um, from kind of what I was suggesting at the end of the talk in terms of what we should be measuring in order to kind of make the case in the future, should we ever need to, um, about our ability to, as an industry, kind of have access to sufficient water is get a better handle on what we use. Because in, in my experience, a lot of folks um, know roughly kind of how much water to put on based on crop condition, but aren't necessarily measuring it in terms of gallons. Um, and that is what's going to translate into kind of a, an ask at the state level. Like we need to protect our ability to access so many gallons per day or so many gallons per month or whatever. Um, and, you know, I think some folks tend to calculate their water usage through, um, through pumps and output and stuff like that, but a much more uh, accurate way to do it is to stick a water meter on your line. And in some places like New Hampshire has a requirement, a reporting requirement. Um, I think a lot more folks have water meters installed in their systems there. And as far as so. you know, the other Northeast or New England states don't have those same requirements for actually measuring your, your usage? Certainly not all of them, no. I'd have to go back and look at, look at our, our notes to see which ones actually required metering 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, okay, it looks like we have time for another question, and there is one here uh, from Gordon, um, kind of a specific to their situation question, but might be helpful for others. Um, he says they're planning to convert from river withdrawal to a well, mm -hmm. um, and that the best location that they found so far is um, for adequate withdrawal via a well is located in the 100-year flood zone. Um, he says the town does not appear to permit an irrigation well in the flood zone. Is there a way around this regulation? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I did. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe the, the DEP folks who will, will be on next week might, um, might have answers for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? And certainly as things come up uh, as we go along, feel free to ask later on. Um, but I will go ahead and introduce Joshua now. Yeah, go ahead. I think you should be able to just share your Okay. You want me to just take it away, Lisa? Yeah, just take it away, Joshua. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and thanks to Rachel for a wonderful introduction and kind of framing um, the conversation of what we kind of um, do with this information around climate change and, you know, potential reductions in availability in water in the future and, and how we can use water more efficiently on our farms, which is what I'm here to talk about. Um, and this is really, um, I kind of want to just tell you a story about our research over the past several years as, as um, we've gotten more involved in this topic of irrigation efficiency and the various technologies that are available out there in the market for improving that on our um, fruit and vegetable farms. And when I say we, I, I need to fully acknowledge Rachel who used to be um, here with us in, in Vermont and, and um, headed um, to Maine, but um, she was a very much a big part of this work. So I, I want to uh, make that acknowledgement up front. All right, so. Let me see if, okay. So just to, to kind of kick us off here, I wanna, um, you know, kind of set the stage in terms of why, um, why we're in this, this kind of situation we are in the Northeast in terms of the need for the, this type of, not just research, but this type of education um, and, and kudos for, to Lisa for, for organizing uh, and the rest of the team down there for organizing a workshop just focused on, on water um, geared, toward, geared toward farmers. I think that's fantastic. I think we need more of that. Um, so, I, you know, in general, we are not, we're, we're not uh, water poor. We're, we're not an arid state. We're not California. We're not Arizona. And I think because of that, there's generally a lack of awareness in the agricultural community, service providers, um, farmers, all of us, in, in terms of what are the impacts on the yield and the quality of our crops um, as a result of water stress. And I think there's, there's great research out there um, that, that um, does give an indication of, of those impacts. And we just don't see that work happening in the Northeast. And I think if we did, um, we might manage or have, be motivated to manage our, our water a little better here. Um, and then again, because because we're we're generally water rich, we, we're not aware of the available technologies that are out there either. Um, so so we saw a great need here. Um, and then there are very few established outreach programs that are specifically focused on this um, topic of of water management um, in in on uh, fruit and veg farms. And, you know, there are individuals um, that are out there that kind of dabble in it, um, but there's, there's no dedicated programs and most of the information that farmers get on this in the Northeast, I, in my experience, comes from either the private sector or from other extension programs in, in states, you know, further west or for the, further south. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a need for us to have a more institutional knowledge in our region around this. So those factors combined with climate change, which, which Rachel did a great job of, of explaining um, kind of what we're seeing and what, to, what we expect to see in the future. Um, and then these somewhat unique, well, maybe not unique, but, but 
characteristics of northeastern farms um, that that create um, this this uh, uh, kind of situation where um, the the need to manage water maybe is is increased by these factors and so one of those is that many of us we have a lot of small farms in the northeast and many of those do use unreliable sources um, and you know I, I visit farms where people are working on sometimes marginal land and they've built small farm ponds which are fantastic in the spring but then they they dry up pretty quick and um and it's shallow wells that are that are not reliable during drought periods we've had a, a decent drought here in vermont this summer and and we've seen some water sources go dry and i think that that happens more often on these small farms that don't have the the money to invest in very reliable sources we also have a lot of diversified farms and beginning farmers who are who are, you know have their resources spread thin and so they they don't have um, the the time or the the money to invest in in kind of the the most appropriate irrigation technology. Um, we also have I think a lack of dedicated labor for irrigation because we're water rich. We have we don't have that one person on the crew in many cases um, that spends the bulk of their time um, scheduling irrigation, checking on soil moisture status, um, working with folks to to move irrigation on a, in a timely manner, move move irrigation sets. Uh, we just don't have that here, and um, of course these regulatory concerns um, drive a need for more research and education, as as Rachel did a good job discussing and then these ever-present questions concerning cost effectiveness and these are kind of in the forefront of my mind as we think about um, climate change of course is bringing more droughty periods but we still have years where it's very wet um, what what level of investment is appropriate on on farms you know because some of these technologies that i'll talk about are not necessarily cheap so um, i think there's there's a lot of uh, so some economic work to be done there as well all right so what what we have done over all the past three or four years is is kind of started to ask the question, um, you know, where are our farmers in terms of their their irrigation efficiency? And so that's, a, that's a big question. We, when we started to think about climate change, and we said, well, how how in the heck are we ever going to answer this? And so we started very simple, um, and we said let's use tools let's use equipment that we may um, that farmers may have an interest in replicating things that are low cost easy to use um, you know um, um, something that that is transferable to other farms um, in the, or at least all of our work has been in vermont other farms in vermont and so we started very simple like i said we started with these um, flow meters that you see on the right hand um, Part of the slide there that's just a mechanical device has a turbine in the um, that is in line with the with the pipe um, and we started to measure irrigation irrigation usage on farms and, and individual fields um, and then we built water balances um, so we looked at how much rain falls on that field how much irrigation is applied and then used some regional values for the expected crop water usage um, so how much water is being taken out of that system and we built course balances um, to just give us a rough idea of are, are these farms and these fields in the in the ballpark for how much water um, how much water being applied matches up with how much water the crop could use and so I'm going to talk about one farm where we did that work in 2018 this is in the Champlain Valley of Vermont it's 30 and a half acres of mixed vegetables on pretty fine sandy well-drained soils fine sandy loam soils well drained and they had a very reliable water source um, a river running right through the farm that 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 never ran dry um, and they had uh, 26 and a half acres um, that received overhead irrigation and four acres that received drip irrigation so these two different blocks that we monitored separately in terms of the water usage and built separate water balances um, for that for that drip irrigation block and that overhead irrigation block. And those are the data I'm going to, I'm going to show you now. So what we saw, what we built this water balance. And so what you're looking at here is the results of that water balance on the over, on that 26 and a half acres that received overhead irrigation. 
and these bar the red bars are the rain amount of rainfall that, that fell on the farm and the blue bars are the irrigation that was applied on that farm and then the important bit here is 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 the green line and that's um the either the deficit or the surplus and so if that green bar is below zero that means um the crops could potentially be, be using more water than what was applied. There's a deficit in the soil. There's a, there's a soil moisture deficit. Um, if that green bar is above zero, that means there's, there's extra water there, that there's more water than what the crop could use. And so what we saw on this farm over three months of monitoring was that um, most weeks of the year, this farm is running at a deficit of anywhere from a half inch to an inch. Um, which was somewhat um, um, concerning if anyone, you know, an inch um, a week of, of a deficit would certainly be expected to impact yield and quality of, of those crops. So the total usage of water on this um, 26 and a half acres, I'm going to walk through the data um, here on the right. I'm sorry, my dog's um, growling in the background. Um, so we had we used 840,000 gallons of water on the farm here, um, and then there was 31,673 gallons per acre, and that was a total, but the total deficit, this farm could have used an extra 2.6 um, million gallons, and that's about 100,000 um, gallons per acre deficit. Okay, so that's, that's maybe then one number to remember here, 100,000 gallons per acre short in terms of what irrigation could be used. And then we also monitored on that drip irrigation block, like I mentioned, and we see the exact opposite. So again, here you're, you're looking at red is the rainfall, blue is the irrigation, and then that deficit, or in most cases, most weeks in the drip irrigation block, that is a surplus. So that green line is most often somewhere between zero and a half inch, and we get up to an inch um, in some weeks of surplus water being applied. And so you think, uh, you know, well, well there may, new, may not be a problem with that, but there may very well be a problem with that. Beyond, you know, kind of the energy expenditures, the gas, the gasoline or diesel or electricity that's being used to apply that water, that also means when excess water is being applied that there's a lot of leaching that can occur. So this farm, of course, um, has nutrients that they're putting down um, with their crops. And when you have water leaching out of the root zone, moving downward, it carries some of those nutrients with it. So there's an economic impact um, of fertility, uh, impacts to fertility and, and um, with this with the surplus water application as well. And so when you look at the stats on this farm, um, on the drip irrigation block, they used almost a million gallons in drip, in water in the drip system. Um, they, and then I'll just jump right to the bottom. They over irrigated by almost a, a hundred thousand gallons per acre. So same farm um, on the overhead irrigation block, they under irrigated by a hundred thousand and on the drip irrigation block, they over irrigated by a hundred thousand gallons per acre. So takeaways from that 2018 work were that, you know, even on the same farm, um, water applications can be wildly variable. Um, and we saw, we, we've done this on a couple other farms and that I think that statement holds true um, even on those other farms. So, so things are very um, <clears throat> unpredictable out there and, 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 and highly variable. Some farms are likely doing okay um, and maybe they are, but they don't really have a good way to check themselves to understand where they are. Um, and so we continued on this, this, this journey to, this, to do research to try to figure out um, how we can build a, a simple out of the box system for farmers that they, can un, that they can know where they are in terms of their irrigation efficiency. And so the next thing we did to this, this flow meter, um, kind of this the startup system we used with flow meters and, and water balances, we added a very simple um, uh, use atmometer is what it's called. And it's that white cylinder there on the right hand side of the screen. And instead of using regional, general regional values for crop water usage, um, these can be placed in an individual field. They have special ceramic discs on the top of them. They're filled with water. And then they um, provide a much better estimate of the 
actual evapotranspiration coming from that particular field for that season. And so this allowed us to sharpen our pencil on that, um, on that water balance approach. And so we did this on another farm um, with this um, improved evapotranspiration estimate. And on this particular farm, this was a two acre block um, of, of production. There were three high tunnels in this block and there were, um, there were also uh, monitoring that occurred on the outdoor production area, um, not in the tunnels. And so here I'm showing the data from uh, almost four months of the growing season on that farm in 2019. And here I've, I've kind of removed the rainfall and precipitation bars and we're just looking at that surplus or deficit line um, as it goes through the season. And as you can see, even amongst, this was a, I think a very well managed farm, even amongst those high tunnels, we saw tremendous variability in terms of the, the water deficit or water surplus. Um, and then I think what is most concerning to me, or, or I think should um, give us pause is that the outdoor fields actually held a much tighter, um, in general, I think surplus or deficit um, closer to zero than the high tunnels did. And, and so, you know, the high tunnels, of course, are a place where we've put a lot of resources. Um, we have a controlled growing environment. These are very high value crops. We want to maximize um, production in those high tunnels um, because we've invested so much and yet we, air water use efficiency or irrigation efficiency is not really where it should be um, on, these, on, on this particular farm where we, where we monitored. Okay, so what do, we, what do we do about this? We, this, is, this journey was not exactly linear. We were, um, of course, dabbling with um, technology, soil moisture sensors all along the way. Um, but I think, you know, I'll kind of talk about our evolution on those um, and that work as, as well, um, which, which kind of happened at the same time we were doing this simple water balance approach. Okay, so when we want to measure soil moisture, um, which is actually soil tension, and, and I think that's um, uh, maybe just an a important point to make quickly, is that when, what we're actually measuring with most of this technology is not how much water is in the soil, we're measuring um, the suction within the soil. So as the soil dries out, it wants to pull water into its pores. And so that's soil tension, and we, most of the measurements we do in, that we call soil moisture, actually measuring how much suction there is in the soil, how much pull in the soil pores on water there would be. Okay, so to start, there are two common options uh, for soil moisture monitoring. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to a couple slides and then come back to this one to talk about those two, two options. Option one is the, the tensiometer. Okay, and this is a tool that has been around for decades. Um, a company, there's, there's one primary company that, that makes these out of, out of California, I'm not promoting or, or, or you know, bashing this company, but it's a barometer and, and that's, that's their tool right there on the right hand side of the screen. I think many of you have probably seen these. These are fairly common um, in, in, at least in, in drier states. And the way this tool works, I've, I've kind of thrown up a schematic there on the left is um, there's a water column within that plastic cylinder and then a porous tip that gets shoved down into the soil. And as the soil dries out and exerts that suction, um, it pulls water through that porous tip. That creates suction in the upper half of the unit and that suction is read on a vacuum gauge. And then there's, there you can kind of see that gauge in both images and that's what we record as, as, soil, temp as soil tension. Okay, so fairly simple technology. Um, pros of, of this tool, of this, of this approach, are there are no electronics. I think that's a good thing. Um, it has a very established track record. Uh, these have been in use, like I said, for decades, and, and there's a lot of experience out there in the field and, and kind of, um, um, I think, good literature and um, uh, information that goes along with these when you do purchase these tools. Um, so that, I think that's a good thing. And they're, I, I would call them fairly affordable. These are 70 bucks a unit for a 12 inch, for a model that would be 12 inches deep. You can pay a little less for a six inch, a little more for a 
uh, 24 inch. Um, and you may be able to shop around and find a little bit better than 70 bucks too. But I, I think that's reasonable for um, one, um, one point, one measurement point. Cons of these, they're easily damaged. I've cracked several of these just in the installation and the handling of them. Um, they do require some O&M. Uh, when you install them, there's, there's kind of a warm up period where you need to uh, use a little hand pump, pump them up, create some initial suction, and then maybe refill them with water um, throughout the season. So it, they do take a little bit of um, a management through the, through the season. And then they're susceptible to frost damage. You can't, of course, you can't leave these in um, through the winter time, and, and you can't even leave them in into the um, uh, late, late or mid fall, late fall, when you might be getting frost because the water in there will freeze and, and crack these units. All right, and then your second option is the granular matrix system or granular matrix sensor. Um, and I have a, a giant picture of one of those on the on the right hand side of the screen. Um, and this is essentially a, a um, uh, two, it's, it's um, two leads of an electrical, of electrical wire and they measure the conductivity through this particular, this white material. Um, and the wetter that material is, this is placed down in the soil, the wetter that material is, the more conductive it is and, and vice versa. And, um, the readout on this is converted, is uses that conductivity and is converted to a soil tension. Um, and so the way you install this is you, you take that uh, green wire, thread it through a, a narrow diameter PVC, um, stick this, this white um, sensor in the, in the base of that, that PVC and then insert it just the same way as you would a tensiometer, use a soil um, sampling probe, make a little hole and, and embed this down to the soil and then run your leads up to the top of the PVC. And then to read this, um, you use a, a device um, that you connect to those leads and it will do that conversion for you, um, converting the conductivity to the, uh, the soil tension. Okay, so pros of these, no O&M. These are, these are pretty durable um, and they're, they're fairly inexpensive. I think about half the cost um, for one of these sensors versus a tensiometer. The cons of these, you do need um, a reader. You need that handheld um, reader to get the, the um, to determine what the soil tension is. And that's about 250 bucks. And then another con, which uh, kind of um, some of the literature goes back and forth on is this is not a direct measurement of soil moisture or tension, it's, it's just measuring conductivity. So something that could affect the conductivity like um, a saline soil, or if there's a lot of salts in a soil could affect your um, soil, soil moisture measurement. Um, and so there's that, that receives a little bit of criticism, but, but these have also been around for, for quite some time. Okay, so those are the two common options and those are what we have, we have tested. Um, I think a, a few points to make um, when you're when you're looking at uh, these these types of sensors, um, it, you're going to need more than one. Right? This is not just one point within the field doesn't tell you what the soil moisture status is across the farm or across that that field. Um, that you'll want to have sensors in various soil types for various crops. Um, you want to get a good spread across the farm. Um, so that that's important to note. Um, and then the manual reading of these requires some vigilance. Um, simple, these, are, these are very simple, they're fantastic in that way, but they only give you the soil moisture at that specific moment in time when you're looking at the gauge or when you're, you take your, your handheld unit out to read the conductivity on the, um, the uh, uh, um, matrix sensor. Readings should be taken at the same interval as irrigation scheduling. So if you measure your soil moisture on Sunday, it, it, has, it has no correlation with what your soil moisture was on Wednesday if you irrigated it on Wednesday. So you have to measure at the same interval at which you're, you're doing your irrigation if you're going to, to gain knowledge about if you're irrigating enough or if you're irrigating too much. Um, so that, that's an important point to make because you just get that one point in time. And then these are very simple um, for understanding if, if I, but, but I think a, a good, uh, you know, kind of advantage of these is, is they're very simple and they're 
if we want to understand where if we're in the ballpark for soil moisture if they're used used appropriately um, they're not going to give us this um, high scale resolution of some of the advanced technologies but they're um, they're generally good to to let us know if we're if we're generally in the right range okay and so advanced technologies um, um, and these you'll these are just coming on the market. Um, I think you know every few months I'll see a new manufacturer that's putting something out, and most of these are web-based. Um, they're a network of soil moisture sensors that are tied to the cloud, um, and you can you can tie in other types of sensors with these as well, temperature or leaf wetness, other other things you might be interested in. A lot of these systems allow you that versatility of of the types of sensors um, that you can add onto your soil moisture sensor. They collect data in real time. You can look at data real time and they create a continuous record of data. So um, if you want to see what the moist, if it's Sunday and you want to see what the soil moisture status was on Wednesday before and after you irrigated, you can do that. You can look back in time and see was I irrigating enough or was I not. Um, it's easily accessible on smartphones or on PCs. I will say there's a very steep, my experience has been there's been a steep learning curve with these technologies um, and, and they're still being developed. Um, and at the same time, with that development, I think costs will come down. But right now cost is um, anywhere from $250 to um, upwards of $400 per unit per um, sensor node um, plus a lot, what a lot of companies do is work on a subscription model. So your data makes it up onto the cloud. And then in order to see your data on the cloud, you have to subscribe to that um, to see that data. And that seems to be the way a lot of things are going in agriculture with data collection. Um, but that there's, there's an annual subscription associated um, with, with that with many of these companies. And here is what you see. I'm gonna to try to finish up here in just a couple minutes. Um, here's what you see when, when you look at the data that is collected by these sensors. Um, this is from a one week period um, on a farm back in June to July. And what you're seeing is, is the soil tension. So as it, got, as, it, as it goes up, it's getting drier and drier. And then I've drawn a red bar across at the 30 um, on the y-axis. And that would be at which our soil is getting dry enough that we want to irrigate. And so if you were watching this closely on your smartphone, you would see that those particular crops, um, what are they, onions and carrots, um, you'd say, okay, here on July 2nd, I need to start irrigating because I'm crossing that threshold at which um, it's starting, it, it will call, have an impact on my crop yield. And then at the bottom of the screen, you're seeing um, actually crops that were being drip irrigated. and you can see the daily irrigation occurring where the uh, blue bar um, kind of drops straight down on every single day. That's where the soil is getting very wet and decreasing the soil tension. And then we have that little bit of flat line and that's when the soil is completely saturated. And I've circled that with a red circle. So this will also help you understand if the soil is completely saturated and you're over irrigating. Um, so good information on both ends of the spectrum uh, with, these, with these sensors. And then I think um, my last point here to make again is that technology has this, this learning curve with it. It's not without its headaches. We've trialed several manufacturers. This is just one example from a, a two week period or a one month period on a farm outside of Burlington where we saw crazy erratic readings um, very difficult to explain. Um, these types, when, when we see data like this deployed on a farm, this doesn't inspire confidence in the farmer, in the technology, and someone on the farm will have to work with this um, kind of tech support with the company to try to get things back down to where they, they make sense. And so I think that's really important not to you know, encourage everyone to run out and buy the latest technology that there are these concerns associated with. It. And we've, we've seen these um, firsthand. And I think some people do have good experiences, but, but um, um, you have to, I, I do think you have to be somewhat tech savvy um, to have immediate success with these, these systems. And just a quick summary. Um, I think we're all over, the, all over the board in the Northeast in terms of how much water we're applying um, versus crop demand. 
Um, and that's because of a number of things, labor constraints, cost, and, and education, and outreach is, is, is lacking, but we're certainly working on that. Um, and, but there are some improvements that are simple and cheap, like these simple sensors that I mentioned, $35, $70 a piece. Um, but I think it requires some outreach from us to talk to farmers about how um, successes and failures with these and how these are used appropriately. And then I think we do need technology appropriate, especially in the Northeast for small and medium sized farms. Um, we, need, we need things that are low cost. We need things that are plug and play for diversified farms, farms that don't have the budgets of these large Western um, farms, um, things that are appropriate for us. And then this question that I mentioned at the beginning, what frequency of drought stress in the Northeast justifies this investment in technology for some of that adva advanced technology? And I don't know the answer to that. And I think there's a lot of good economic work that can happen um, related to this question of, of, you know, how many drought years in 10 years does it, does it justify the investment in this, in this technology? And then I just have a quote there from a, a farmer that we've worked with quite a bit. Um, I'll let you read that. And, and um, I think this is the situation many people find themselves in the perspective many farmers have um, in the Northeast. And I hope that we can um, alleviate this somewhat and kind of find the sweet spot in terms of um, the technology that's available, the simple technology and and making sure people are not put in this, this position and, and they're prepared when we do have a drought. Okay, that's my last slide. I, I think I've, I've probably talked longer than I intended to, but maybe we have. All right, we have time for it. Thank you so much, Joshua. That was really very interesting. Um, does, if it, I don't see any questions in the chat right now, but if people do have questions, um, we can give a couple minutes um, before Tim and Max come on. Um, and I, I'm curious of other people, if people have used some of these things, if do people routinely measure um, their soil moisture on their farms as a, as a way to determine their irrigation needs? Um, let's see, well, Sue, our very own Sue Shortley asks the question. <laughs> um, are there trends that you see, Joshua, as far as which crops tend to be over or under irrigated? Um, and are drip irrigated crops more likely to be overwatered relative to overhead ir irrigated crops? Mm -hmm kind of all over the place. Yeah, um, we haven't done any crop to uh, crop, to crop comparisons. Um, so I can't, I can't really answer that question. Um, I do think um, that the likelihood of drip irrigated crops being over irrigated is higher um, simply because people oftentimes have those drip irrigation systems on a timer or they're doing a daily you know, irrigation, whether it rains or whether it doesn't. Um, and there's not that labor associated with moving surface irrigation, moving the sprinklers, moving the solid sets. Um, and it's easy to do. It's easy to set the timer regardless of the weather. And so I think the likelihood, um, that would be my guess, I don't have data to back that up, is, is probably higher for the, for the drip irrigated crops. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, there's one more, or a couple more. Um, so how deep should soil, should a soil probe be placed and do shallow rooted plants versus deeper rooted plants need different probe depths? Um, and then do cover crops increase or decrease the soil? Yep. Moisture? yep. So a good, uh, you know, what we've used on most of our soil moisture sensor placements is 12 inches. There's a, there's a nice publication and it comes, uh, Erometer has it on their website where they go through crop by crop um, and specify what the recommended depth of the soil moisture sensor placement is. So that would be a good, you know, I can refer someone to that publication, but 12 inches um, for most of our annual crops, 12 inches is appropriate. You know, a lot of the research on that it's um, at deeper depths has occurred on perennial crops like almonds and, and grapes and, and things like that in, in the West. As far as cover crops, I, um, I've done, I actually have done a little bit of soil moisture monitoring on, on cover crops and I've seen a decrease in the spring in terms of um, drying soils out a little bit, um, and which, you know, sounds bad, but it's actually a good thing if you're, if you're trying to get into the field. Um, but I don't have a tremendous amount of data on that. That was one experience on one farm. I know they've done a little bit of that in row cropping systems in the Midwest, um, so you could look to that literature as well. 
Um, and then one last question, how much does that field ET monitor cost? Um, you know which one he's talking about? Does it come with yeah. Wi-Fi data transfer? Yeah, um, so I can, I can, if you email me, Glenn, uh, I'll send you a link, um, but that, I believe that was right around, I want to say $150. I don't know that, uh, you, I think you can get a logger. I'm not sure if you can get a Wi-Fi data transfer system for it. Um, if you had a pressure transducer that you um, had hooked up to a Wi-Fi data transfer, you could certainly equip that that um, ET monitor with it because it's just the the height of the water column, so it's it's easily um, read as pressure. It's ET gauge. If you look up etgauge.com or ET gauge, Google it. You'll you'll find it. Thank you so much. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. And um, for Tim and Max from Kitchen Garden Farm, they just shared a few photographs of some of the, it looks like it was um, as you're getting ready to put in the tile drainage. Um, and then some, I'll try and get your video to play of um, you irrigating with, it looks like the, the wobblers that you have. So if I can get that shared. Okay, so that's you. <laughs> if you wanted to just um, introduce your farm a little bit and talk about just whatever you want to talk about in terms of putting in these um, different, the, the, it sounds like you had a new well put in recently and, and the irrigation equipment that you're using. Great. Um, can people see us? Because I, I, I see Lisa on my screen right now. I see yeah, I can, you, and there's you. I think you can switch around how many people you see at a oh, time. Okay. Um, so if you go to like the gallery view yeah. or like a nine, a nine by grid in that, you can see more. I can see Great. now. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, um, I just want to thank uh, organizers for mercifully putting us last because the first time I had to think about this was when I sat down for this meeting. So great. Appreciate that. Got a nice little outline here. Um, our farm, <clears throat> and uh, I want to introduce Max as well, but I'll just talk about our farm for, for a little bit. Um, we are located right here in Sunderland, Mass, which is five minutes from UMass. Um, we're farming uh, the kind of soils that you can see from the top of Mount Sugarloaf. Um, so those are, it's pretty pretty great spot. Um, we have uh, about 50 acres in crops for the last several years, going on about average around 50 acres. Um, Max is our production manager. He's also here. He's going to help uh, me do this hey presentation. Guys. Max is an excellent farmer and also a graduate of Stockbridge, correct? Yeah. At UMass. Um, Max has been with us for about seven years. And uh, he does his job as production manager far better than I ever have. So um, <laughs> he's going to be a great resource for us in terms of like the, the sort of the new innovations that we've had on irrigation this year uh, uh, since we've done more irrigation than ever. And when I say we, I mean Max and his crew. So um, I just want to back up a little bit. <clears throat> um, to, to sort of talk about the genesis of how we think about uh, irrigation on the farm. Uh, and it goes back to about 2012 when uh, I discovered Instagram and um, slowly sort of over the years started connecting with other farmers in different areas of the country. And by 2015, I think I was connected sort of on a personal level with about several hundred farms in all of the regions of the US and was really interesting experience sort of getting in touch with all these folks seeing the different um, types of growing practices that were common in different regions thinking of sort of the north carolina um, mid-atlantic region north pacific northwest seattle california uh, desert arizona so uh, just beginning to see sort of similar farms to ours and how different people in different areas uh, manage everything but 
Um, anyway, <clears throat> I basically think our, you know, so uh, thanks to the first presenter for, for mentioning climate change and how it impacts water use on the farm. But um, a couple years ago, we started, I, I personally started thinking that um, our region here in Northeast, New England, Pioneer Valley specifically, we're going to start having summers that are more like Virginia, North Carolina, and that's exactly what's happened in the last five years. Um, even though that we've had some very, very wet years, including 2018, that year we actually had two months where we didn't really get any rain in the spring. And so I would say, and then uh, 2016 is also memorable because that was the first time that we had essentially no rain for the entire growing season. And that had never happened in anyone's memory here. Um, so 2016, we really kind of decided that we needed to get real about irrigation. And um, there's a couple of things about our farm that uh, present sort of interesting challenges to doing an irrigation system that have led to our particular um, approach. So I'll just give you a little background. Um, we have about three, three different soil types that we're farming. Um, everything from very well-drained, excessively drained, even sandy uh, fields in Waitley uh, that are on like a plateau near the river, um, but on a higher elevation. And then we have uh, riverbank uh, silt loams that are very well, um, well drained, but also uh, good at moisture retention. And then we have um, at our home farm location in Sunderland, we're at a very low elevation and it's a little bit swampy, but um, the soil there is actually sandy. Um, we call it the floating sand because the water table is, is like right there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we have, like I said, we farm 50 plus acres and, um, we have different fields all over the place and they're all between half an acre and eight acres. So we decided that um, after doing an initial like well point, shallow, shallow well um, system at our main farm in 2008 or something, um, once we started getting on these other pieces, uh, we, we decided that we're gonna, even though they're rented, um, we're going to put in these shallow wells, well points. Um, so these are easy to, easy, you know, relatively easy to install. They're not appropriate in all locations, which is, which is a downside, but they're about $2,500 to install. Um, there's a guy based out of New Hampshire that comes down and, and, and works for farms down here. Uh, his name is Bob Tupper, Bob Tuppa. I like to call. Uh, anyway, um, so we have a couple of different wells that, you know, essentially it's a two inch pipe just jammed in the ground. The water's 10 feet to 20 feet below the surface generally. And um, like I said, it's easy to install. It's fairly inexpensive. The pump that we uh, use, we have a half a dozen of them at this point. It's about 600 bucks. So the startup cost is pretty low. Um, the water tends to be of good quality. Uh, we don't use any kind of filtration on it at all, which is probably amateur mistake, but we haven't had any problems so far. Um, one example of uh, something that we deal with specifically is by top throw, because we grow a lot of peppers. So we, we have, you know, this is an example of what, you know, us kind of deciding to spend the money for, we have a, this tiny field, it's like less than an acre. It's, got, it's very sandy, it's very fertile as long as it's got moisture, but there was no, no water like available on this field. So it was always kind of a crapshoot what we were gonna get out of it. But we're like, let's just spend the 2,500 bucks, put in the well, we grew peppers last year, no phytophthora, and uh, you know, peppers are a very important crop to us so it was it was worth it and and this year we used the well again so as long as we continue to rent the farm it'll be have been worth it that particular field anyway um 
So we have basically two different types of irrigation as were mentioned in the other presentations. We use drip, um, drip irrigation under plastic mulch for a lot of crops. Uh, this year we had about 18 to 20 acres of drip installed on crops such as peppers, tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, eggplants. And we also do some leafy crops on plastic as well. We do onions, scallions, uh, herbs, basil, celery, and fennel on plastic. Um, and then for bare ground crops, we use um, micro irrigation sprinklers. As you can see there, these are wobblers that are run off a one inch poly tube. <coughs> These are also pretty inexpensive up front, um, but obviously with any sort of overhead system, the cost really is moving it. Uh, so there's labor involved in setting it up, moving it around. Um, and the drip tends to be more expensive up front, but is much easier to use. Um, so those are sort of the pros and cons on our farm about those things. Um, so yeah, this year we did about 15 acres of overhead micro sprinkler wobblers on crops like lettuce, kale, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, radicchio, which we grow a lot of, um, root crops, carrots, etc., salad greens, and radishes. So uh, we work with brain flow irrigation. Thank you for providing that convenient slide there. Uh, Right, and so I haven't even looked at the prices recently. We just buy them, but they're pretty inexpensive. Um, we're getting back to the wells. We're getting about, it varies, but we get 30 to 60 gallons a minute per, you know, per field. So we, we can water half an acre to an acre of drip at a time. This year we were doing more than that um, on a couple of fields that we have uh, access to surface water on. Um, but the overhead is, you know, it's kind of challenging to manage on the low flow uh, wells at times. But so far we haven't run out of any, um, we haven't run out of water. Even though this year I, I feel like I haven't, I don't know like the exact data on this, but between May and the end of August, we probably got less than three inches of rain and it averages an inch a week. So we're, we're probably behind 10 plus inches at this, at this, for this season. So um, Max and his crew did a lot of irrigation, a lot of setting up headers, a lot of moving, tubing around, setting up things in different places. And um, also uh, for the first time, we really got into um, doing injection on plastic crops, uh, plastic mulch crops, especially. So I was wondering if Max um, wanted to talk specifically about sort of, um, you know, anything that comes to mind in terms of managing, you know, 40 acres of micro irrigation. <laughs> which is not a small yeah job. for sure and uh and uh especially the injection and also some of the innovations that you made in uh tunnel tomato watering this year oh geez okay yeah there's a lot to cover here um yeah it's been i feel like we just just this week we're feeling kind of with the shift to seasons able to kind of to put away some of the irrigation that we've there was it seemed like you know there was a like couple waves of drought this year but it was pretty nonstop. We kind of, we got really good at it. I feel like, the, like Tim pointed out in 2016, we kind of first got our first taste of like a, a serious drought season and uh, started to invest in the equipment. And um, there, there's nothing like having the actual pressure of, of drought to kind of, um, to get your system, to, to dial in the systems and make them, make them really work. Uh, but this year it really felt like kind of, we really turned a corner because we were, able to put the, this is, this is really uh, underlining what Josh was saying in the last talk there, um, to put enough like labor towards, uh, towards managing irrigation, just to, just to put, to, to get everyone on the same page that like, um, has been 
a really a, a, a big uh, and a big change this year. I mean, we've, we, we kind of started building out the, um, uh, the right amount of equipment um, for our uh, scale over the past couple of years, but uh, just kind of starting to, starting to be more intentional and figuring out exactly how much of each type of hose we needed and uh, to be stocked enough in supplies um, this year that's so that when we go out to a field we have everything we need and enough backup parts and we're still we're still kind of trying to figure that out and get it real real dialed in um, but yeah I I guess uh, I don't even know should we start with with the the drip system um, <laughs> yeah uh, you're, you're going to say that to talk about the, the injector a little bit. Um, we've been using rain flows. It's pretty, it's a pretty simple, like two gallon, um, field injector. Uh, and I feel like having, having a low tech system has been really, uh, effective for us. Pretty, pretty expensive. They're like $250. Um, and they basically, they were, they run off of, uh, so what, We've been mostly working with Rainflow, and that's that's been a pretty simple because they don't have like a they don't they they will, they have a bunch of scales, but uh, they you know have specific setups for for like this this size farm. I feel like there's like a fifty acre farm kind of like uh, set of equipment that they try to sell. We get the pump from them and the the running off all of our main um, main parts off of two inch hose. Um, so the injectors run off of a two inch, uh, and so to have all the parts kind of line up, that's been, that's been big. Um, and uh, I don't know if we didn't get a picture of this or anything, but we've been using a lot of cam locks. Um, that that's been a really effective system for us. So just just to have like pieces that fit together easily, uh, and and redundant redundant systems so that we can like we if we're running two inch to our to our drip system we can also we have the, it's also the same um header pieces for our sprinkler system um and you can interchange you can unlock one system if we have a field that has uh drip irrigation and and sprinklers uh and hook a different one in um off of the same pump so it's like it's the it's all it's all the same stuff and everything runs off of hose clamps that you know I mean sorry everything gets connected with hose clamps um which are all the same you know they take the same socket wrench I mean that that's like something that I've I've learned that like to have everyone have a, have the tool to put on a hose clamp that's that's like in a, even in itself like little things like that have made a big difference yeah because you go out into the field you're like oh there's you know there's a leak right there oh but I don't have the tool so yeah just having the tools that you need yeah. Yeah, I guess I just really wanted to underline that that, that how much it's it mattered to have have a crew of people that know not just have one person that knows how to do irrigation on on a farm but to have everyone on the same page where they they understand how the system fits together so that you can all you can all do something really quick. So like cuz like moving moving sprinklers is is frankly a pain in the ass, but you can if you if if you have a crew of four or five people, they can do it in 10 minutes it's it's pretty impressive if everyone knows how to how to set that system up everyone knows how to if if you end up you know having to troubleshoot a pump on one end everyone else can get all the sprinklers set up and move it really quickly through a field um max i have a had, question yeah um, sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. um but just curious if you guys are doing any of that monitoring that josh talked about as far as the soil moisture or the water usage and then second question um, you guys are organic farm. What are you um, injecting for fertilizers? Um, do you want me to answer that, Tim, or do you want to take Yeah, it? you can answer it. Uh, we don't have any of those monitors currently, but I'm really interested in that. Uh, that seems like something that'd be really helpful. Also, to, I, I kind of had some questions for Josh, but I didn't really get to get in there. I don't know if he's still on, but um, yeah, just about how you would monitor uh, different crops uh, based on like the the, the very various needs and based on soil type. I don't know if that that can. I'm sure that that's different and changes 
um, how a crop grows. Um, but for injecting, we we will inject. Uh, we've been using a, a just a bunch of different organic products. We it'll be like fish or um, a little bump of nitrogen um, at like the appropriate time to side dress. Um, we've also been using a line of. Uh, I don't. I, don't feel, I feel like I don't want to like plug specific companies, but we've been using Advancing Eco Agriculture's product products a bunch. So that's a whole like just fertilizing program. Oh huh. yeah, just this, curious if you had. Yeah. So what is what is in those mixes? It's a mixture of like um, some beneficial yeah uh, microbes and and then like molassesy kind of stuff to feed them and then... yeah microbes things to feed the microbes and uh, a lot of the the major the you know macro and micronutrients um, based on what our soil tests are telling us we need. Um, we've been deficient in calcium a lot and boron. That's been the most consistent. Um, so we'll, we'll inject products for that. Yeah, and we've had serious yield reductions due to, to um, you know, a lot of the soils that we're on, you know, have been farmed conventionally, you know, potatoes, uh, a lot of potatoes being grown on the land that we've gotten recently. So, you know, we're inheriting a generation of uh, you know, not the best attention to the micronutrient levels. And um, so, you know, the, the injecting can really help, you know, get fruit set, on, you know, fruit crops and, you know, to time your calcium um, applications um, around when the flowering happens and when the fruit set is and just try to make sure you don't miss your window can, can really improve yield and quality. I also wanted to say it was it's been really uh this is the this is like the goal that we've been working towards uh is to really get irrigation systems set up regardless of whether or not we've really forecasted drought because you can use them you know there's there's a number of uses i mean one it would be to inject to make sure we have the right nutrition i mean it's convenient that if you it's been convenient to to have a drought and you know you have to irrigate anyway then you can just plug in nutrients but um to just, but also even for overhead irrigation, which I guess has been shown in some of these slides is a little less effective at getting the ground to saturated. Um, we've been hoping to work towards using that as a, in combination with the cult, as a cultivation tactic for preparing beds, getting them wet, maybe even using like flame, flame weeding or some sort of blind cultivation. Um, because it's just an extremely useful tool. If you, if you feel like you can really get, you can start to use irrigation as your, as like a, as a weed management tool also. So that's been really good. This is, this is what I was talking about, about Max being very good at his job. We're like working towards that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is one, I have this sort of leading picture up here um, for you to talk about the, the tile drainage that you installed too, but I, there is one question um, just about the, the installer that you use for the shallow wells and whether or not you'd be willing to share their um, yeah, sure. information. Um, um, yeah, sure. Yeah. You can share it with me yeah. and I can send it yeah. out to folks or if you want to pop it into the chat or something. If you oh, can. right. Okay. Maybe you don't have it on your. Yeah, I got it right here to everyone. The guy's name is Bob Tupper. <laughs> the, from the extension perspective, no, um, no endorsement is uh, <laughs> attended. I mean, he's the guy. For me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called Washwell, and he's he's in New Hampshire. Um, he's the only he's the only guy I've ever heard of uh, doing it around here. So. Um, and this is not, you know, this is not high tech. This is, uh, you know, they come with some pipes and like a pump and they, you know, essentially they pump water, they put, come with a huge tank of water and they pump water into the pipe and then they reverse the flow and then pump out the, you know, the mixture or whatever. So it only works, it's not gonna work if you have rocks. Mm -hmm. You have rocks anywhere in your, in your, you know, soil profile, it probably won't work. Um, and also you have to have, you know, the water, I don't know, it's got to be like just right. But in, here in the valley, it's like fairly common. But I, I know that another farm that's close to us over in Amherst is only like five miles away, has a completely different soil type, They're higher, 
you know, ought to come out there and it just like didn't, didn't go well. Yeah. So um, you have to, I think it's, it works best where you have a, a high water table and like sand specifically as your subsoil. Um, I'll point out that Rachel uh, put a link in the chat that um, about a, a case study that they did at Intervale, that UVM did at Intervale about um, irrigation and the sort of economic, uh, they did an economic analysis of whether or not it was worth it to install the and use irrigation in both wet and dry years, it seemed that it was. So you can take a look at that. And I just wondered if you did want to talk at all about this um, tile drainage sure. that you put in, yeah. I mean, I just want to say again, like, um, I do feel like with climate change, growers need to be ready to irrigate everything they have in the ground every year with really no, no exception because even like I said, in, even in a wet year, historically wet year, second wettest year ever, um, we were irrigating everything in early July. So, you know, that season would have been worse for us had we not irrigated despite then getting deluged. And then also, you know, you know, that, you know, we get, I don't know, average of 52 inches of precipitation in New England, which roughly an inch a week, but you never know when it's going to fall. So, you know, August to September tends to, you know, be a little bit drier normally. But then, you know, there's a year like Hurricane Irene, which is like smack in the end of August when you got not only all your fall crops are like half grown, but, and, and then you got all your summer crops trying to get harvested and it's like, whoa, um, not much you can do about that, except we did this tile drainage pro project here. Um, didn't great, get, didn't get great photos, but um, there, in, on our home farm in Sunderland, which when we started the farm, you know, as many other is other people who might have started their own farm from scratch might know, good land isn't always available to buy. And we bought a piece of land that seemed great. And then when we started growing on it, we're like, oh my God, this is wet. So um, the soil is good and it's fertile. We just happen to have, um, topographical issues. And <clears throat> basically that means that we're kind of at the base of a uh, mountain and then the land slopes up as you get toward the river. So we're kind of like in one of the lower spots in town. And so when it rains five inches plus, it just stays wet for a week or more. And so if you have crops out there, it's not great. So we got a grant from MDAR, the ACRE program. I believe that's MDAR. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Um, Jerry, do you guys know Jerry? He was very interested in this project. Um, I think it was a 80% cost share with MDAR. So we paid, it cost $50,000 to do 12 acres of this drainage tile and I wish I could tell you if it works or not, but it was a really dry year. We just installed it last winter. So um, it's, it's I, I, I honestly, I think it, it does work. Um, we have seen water draining out of the end of it, but um, how well it's gonna work in a five inch rain event, I don't know, we haven't had one, so. Go for it, Max. Oh, I was just going to add that I haven't, I haven't seen standing water sit for, usually there's still standing water that'll form in certain pockets of that, of this farm and it, and it hasn't sat for more than three days this year. It's mm -hmm. definitely different. So, you know. Yeah, no, I think it's good. I think it's a good investment. Um, the guys that installed it reported having more issues than they were expecting during the installation. So, it's a pretty big chunk of change to spend if you don't know whether they're going to have a good time doing it <laughs> or like be able to install it effectively because it was, you know, they had to bring like, I don't know, seven pieces of equipment from New York state and all this pipe and major, major project. 
but we're we're very grateful to be the guinea pig for MDAR in terms of uh, trying to figure out whether or not this is a good thing for Pioneer Valley. Yeah, and thanks for yeah. being the uh, guinea pig there. Yeah, <laughs> no, <it's> my pleasure. <laughs> so just as people are logging off, I just want to make sure that I thank everybody that, that spoke tonight, um, Rachel and Joshua and Tim and Max, I really, really appreciate your time and all of your expertise and I'm certainly